Thank you all for being here. Sorry. Um, and Billy Goldenberg, I'm so appreciative of your coming all the way from the West Coast. He is an East Coast guy originally, though, from Philadelphia. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's truly an honor to be talking about um, Billy's work and screening some of the highlights for you today. Um, he really has a remarkable career, um, ver varied and rich, and I think um, you've done, I don't know if you've ever counted, in 22 years you've done 25 films. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. Thank As you. a full-fledged editor. And um, in 2012 he actually won the trifecta, which is um, in the editing world, I, which is the Eddie, the Oscar, and the BAFTA Award. And, and I think Walter Murch and Michael Connor, the only two other editors who competed against themselves that year, th that year you competed against yourself for Zero Dark Thirty and um, Argo, for which he won the Oscar. Um, and actually, um, Billy's been nominated five times for an Oscar, and every one of those films we're going to show clips from tonight. Um, so um, I think one of the things that is sort of a standout thing about Billy's career is um, the incredible variation in genre that he has. He's you've pretty much covered every conceivable genre. Um, an example being last year, um, Unbroken and The Imitation Game. And then somewhere along the line, you did Transformers Age of Extinction, <laughs> which is kind of um, symbolically kind of shows you that kind of um, very variation in genres. But also, I think um, Billy has had an amazing um, ability to work in a lot of challenging work situations with not only multiple editors, but editors, uh, directors who are, um, we'll say it in a diplomatic way, perfectionist, obsessive, somewhat. Um, he's done four films with Michael Mann. I think he should get an award just for that, perhaps. So, um, so, does, my so does my wife. <laughs> um, two with Michael Bay, maybe another award for that. Um, <laughs> but also, um, he's, he does a lot of repeat work with, uh, with directors, which speaks of his ability to have a very, you know, um, wonderful rela working relationship with these directors, among them Gary Ross, um, Ben Affleck, um, John Turtletop, and um, yeah, as I said, Michael Mann. I can't keep, I have to keep bringing that up. Um, <laughs> but I think what, what really is, for me, the standout um, part of um, Billy's gift is his ability to really, um, his sensitivity to sub subtext and finding the tone of a film, and also, and this is actually a quote from Gary Ross, um, um, Finding the nuance with character and performance, I mean, this is just so, such a, such a huge part of what he brings to every film he works on. Um, and so I wanted to, because um, I don't want to keep talking about him in the third person, um, I wanted to rewind and go back to how you started to become an editor. And originally you, you were going to, for about six months, you were going to be a doctor, I think. Is that right? Well, yeah, my father was obsessed with my brother and I both being doctors, and my brother eventually became a dentist, and um, so I went to Temple University in Philadelphia with the idea, of, uh, very briefly, of becoming a doctor uh, at his insistence. Uh, and, you know, about two months into chemistry, I was baffled, so uh, and I was always in loved film, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I went into the film department because, luckily for me, Temple has a really great film school. And uh, and I found my way there, trying every different thing, and made some some terrible short films, and uh, eventually landed in a class called experimental video, where I did a lot of sort of very strange video projects, uh, just kind of exercises in juxtaposition and trying all kinds of different things. And I was so terrified of showing the work that uh, I waited the entire year uh, and kept putting it off, putting it off, until at the very end I had to show an entire year's worth of work at the, on the last day of class and. Um, and uh, strangely enough, it actually turned out that the teacher was really positive about it, and especially about the editing. So he encouraged me to pursue it as a, as a career. 
and no one had really ever encouraged me in the arts before, and so and I really enjoyed doing it. So I ran with that and came to or went to California with the idea of of being an editor, and luckily for me, it worked out. Yeah, I mean, you made an interesting comment um, that no one encouraged you to be an artist. It is interesting when you grow up in a world where you don't have role model or context and just to find your confidence and I can understand why it took you a year because you know that would you're jumping in and you don't know whether you have the gift well I mean I, I think that you know I didn't I grew up in a family family it was in the restaurant business so it, yeah. we, we didn't there was no ever, no one ever did anything like that and and it's taken me a, you know a career's worth to sort of gain that confidence and I think but that's partly what makes me, I think, good at it is my sort of insecurity about it, and you know, always being, you know, trying to make it perfect and never giving up, and those sort of things. Because, I mean, you say it's been 20, 22 years. Is that right? um, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like every film I, I'm as terrified in the beginning as I was 20, 22 years ago. Yeah, that's it's very interesting because I I've had a lot of these conversations with master editors, and no matter how successful they are. And maybe this is also the adrenaline that drives the artist, but never being, having, you know, every film you start, you think, am I a fraud? Am I going to, are they going to, what did you say? The edit police is going to yeah, find me? Bur <laughs> burst down the door and take me away and take all my, my editing card or whatever that, you know, <laughs> away from me. Um, well, I mean, every film is his own, creates its own set of problems and unique to that film. So it always feels, uh, there's, often a lot of sequences in films where you just don't know how to put it together and you look at all the footage, I mean, especially really big scenes, when I look at the, all the footage sometimes, uh, as I'm watching it, I'm still, I'm thinking to myself, how am I ever gonna put this together and where do I start and I have no clue and, uh, you know, so you get that, that anxiety feeling that doesn't ever go away. Yeah, um, and we, we've actually sort of cherry-picked certain things that will point this out. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, how did you become an apprentice on The Breakfast Club? Um, I, there was a guy, there's a guy named Tom Finnan who uh, is an editor, and uh, he was one of the editors on Platoon. And I had somebody, uh, somewhere along the way earlier on, I had, uh, he called and said, do you, you know, we need an apprentice, do you know any, anybody who's available? And he, I got a job, not on that film, uh, his recommendation, even though he had never met me. And he got me about four jobs without ever before I met him. And one of them, the, the fourth one, happened to be on The Breakfast Club. It was a secret project that, you know, and that happens a lot where they say, it's a movie, we can't tell you what it is, and are you available? And, and then I found that it was Dee Dee Allen, who I was, you know, admired from afar for my, you know, entire, entire life. And, um, you know, so I got, got the job as an apprentice. And, but, you know, those days I was, I was in a room down the hall from her, putting trims away, you know, film trims, because it was obviously uh, a film show, not digital. Um, and then, I, so I, but I did get, a, I was around her enough to get a lot of sort of pearls of wisdom and a lot of the way she conducted herself and the w things she said and how she sort of laughed at the rules of editing. I mean, she would always, she would make cuts and say, they'd say this is, you know, this is breaking the rules and she would laugh and think it was <laughs> the funniest thing in the world. Um, so, and watching her and the way she, not only the way she, cut but the way she conducted herself and, and the, the, the way she took charge of the of the of the space you know and took charge of the film and, and really understood how to you know bend the film into something that she wanted it to be was really an incredible lesson the first and that was uh, you know three or four films in I think four films in so um, being a just being around her energy was an incredible experience and called her a force of nature yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean she uh, I just remember being at the film at Deluxe Labs with her and uh, or Technicolor actually we were running prints and they tried to tell her that one print that she saw the day before matched the one she saw that day and she was saying no 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 it's not and then they put up both side by side and she was of course correct and one was two points red or and then on the way back into the in the parking lot she said don't they know who I am <laughs> and but it was in a way that wasn't conceded. It was just like, don't they know the experience I bring here? Don't they know how much I know? And, you know, and um, I don't know. She was. Uh, I really hit it off with her, and um, I was lucky enough. She apparently didn't give apprentices credit, and it was a huge deal when I got a credit on that movie. I was really, really uh, overwhelmed. You said you get a lot of street cred with all the things you've done. Yeah, you mentioned Breakfast like, Club. Oh, you won an Oscar <laughs> for Argo, but you, oh, you worked in the Breakfast Club. And like that, <laughs> that is like you have no idea how many people are. are think that's the greatest thing. 
Well, here's an interesting, I mean, this is in terms of her courage to just do what she felt is right and let the emotions drive the film and the story drive the film is um, somewhere along the line when they were shooting The Breakfast Club, well, Molly Ringwald cut and dyed her hair and everybody was freaking out about it matching and she says, if you're watching your hair, you're dead. <laughs> and she was not concerned. Um, so I thought, and it, she said in terms of dialogue editing, which she thought, which we all know is the hardest thing to do, much harder than action, especially when you have a bunch of people in a room and that's the entire film. And she said it was her favorite film in that regard. It was the most challenging. And she really, I mean, John Hughes was around, but not, you know, as I came to learn over the years, I mean, most directors are around a lot more. I mean, she, the first cut of that film, I think, was three hours and 40 minutes. and. Uh, she cut it down basically by herself, I and mean, she cut the film. And he would come uh, come around for screenings, but I mean, she did that. She was she was the one who cut that on her I own. I think he called her a ca the cowboy of the editing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he was in awe of her. Um, and you 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 were very much soaking up the wisdom of those around you who inspired you. You mentioned John Wright as well, who did. Um, Speed and um, Hunt for Red October. Yeah, he was the first editor I worked for on a TV movie called High School USA. And um, I just was lucky enough to fall into, I was working as a production assistant for that company and they were kind enough to give me a job as an apprentice editor. And it happened to be for John Wright who had, was, had come back from doing a bunch of features just to do that film as a favor for this company. And from John and his assistant, Kathy Verkler, they taught me how to do things in a way that was a really a feature way and, 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 and a really top-notch way. And I didn't know how lucky I was at the time, but they, um, they were incredibly, uh, both incredible influences on me in terms of work ethic and how to do things in a way that was you know, the, the top of the game sort of thing. And, um, and uh, John taught me a lot. You know, every editor you, that I've worked for along the way, they'll say things that stick in your mind you know, for the rest of your career, and John, you know, had some of those, and uh, my, you know, Michael Kahn had the most of them in terms of the stuff I, I you know, rules I follow and things I you know, do. I thought I thought one of the things you mentioned I thought was really interesting. Uh, he said, "Don't ever let things end." We well, was talking about action yeah. scenes, like don't let shots end, don't let fit shots finish, keep things, you know, build it up to just the you know the highest point and then cut. You know, don't so let the audience off the hook. Like, yeah. I love that. Yeah, that's and that great. really worked. You know, that's I mean, all I had that in my mind while I was cutting Argo. I mean, th you know, things like never letting you know taking things right to the hilt and cutting, leaving the audience on the edge of their seat. Yeah, it's a great, great advice. But y um, the true great mentor that. Um, Billy Goldenberg had with Michael Kahn, who was actually our honoree last year. Um, I didn't even realize that when we, we <laughs> scheduled this event, but um, he, you said it was your film school. And um, we, I mean, he does have incredible, w in terms of obviously his talent, but his wisdom too. Can you talk about some of the things, the highlights of what you learned from him? Well, I mean, Michael was like free graduate school and on the highest level. He, and he really, took it upon himself to help me too. I mean, he really, he s used to say to me, because I, I was in, it was really frightening. I came on as his first assistant and I was, you know, I knew, you know, there's a lot of pressure there and he has a reputation for being very difficult as well. And he- King Kong. Yeah, he, um, <laughs> there are stories about him throwing movieolas out windows and things like that. Um, but I don't think they were true, I hope. Um, <laughs> and, but he, he would give me things to do, scenes to cut along the way and, and he would say to me, you don't know your talent that I do. So, and he, when somebody like that says that to me, I mean, I, I was, you know, I just couldn't believe it. I, and then he really took me under his wing and taught me his philosophy about, uh, about editing, his methodology, how he approached scenes, how to handle myself politically, how to take criticism, which is probably the most important thing any editor can learn because it can be painful when people don't like things you've done and that's basically what you do for a living is take criticism and he would he would give me uh, he did this with one scene on a live where um, he made me recut it I don't know 20 times he just kept giving me more and more and more changes and I finally came to him and said I just don't think I'm very good at this because I'm clearly not getting this right I'm not uh, you, you always have notes and I'm not I just can't make you happy and he said, you don't understand, it has nothing to do with the scene you're cutting. I'm just trying to get you to learn how to take criticism, to learn how, you know, and it was the most valuable thing I ever learned because, you know, you have to learn that it's about the film and not about you and you have to, 
you know, take criticism with a smile and say, great idea, and let's, you know, and uh, hope, uh, hopefully that sparks another idea and to t take it in a positive light so that, you know, for, you know, e as soul crushing as it can be sometimes. Um, but, and uh, it really does make a difference in your editing too, not just your sort of personal well being, but it, it makes a difference because you think about it in a positive way and the movie gets better. And if, uh, obviously, the, m the movie's all that matters and how it turns out will be what gets you your next job. So, um, you know, and he, and there are th his things that he would say along the way are still things that run through my mind all the time. And, and all of us who worked for him will get into situ tough situations. And the first, I mean, I literally hear the words in my head, what would Mike do? And I think about how he would handle certain situations and then I find it much easier. So That's I can't, wonderful. I mean, obviously I can't say enough about it, what he did for me. Lu use your forebrain, if you want to explain. Right, he would say, you know, he would say, he would say things like, you know, if you want to go faster, slow down. Meaning, don't worry about all the film that you have to cut. Don't worry about the budget of the movie and how much pressure there is. Just worry about the cut in front of you. Worry about what you're doing. And don't worry about anything else. Shut the rest of it out. Don't worry that you're 50,000 feet of film behind. Um, and if you slow down and just take one thing at a time, you'll actually do things faster, and it, it works every time. And, and he was like, lose your foreway, meaning just lose yourself in the footage, you know, and those are the best days that I have where you do, you know, I watch the dailies over and over again, you know, I figure out an approach to a scene, and he would always say, take a point of view, don't cut anything before you know what story you're telling, what the point of view of the scene is, where you are in the film, you know, really know what you're about to do. Take an, have the approach you're gonna take with the cut in your head before you do it. Don't just start cutting. And, and, then, and then once you do all that, you get lost in the footage and, and the best days are when you, know, you start cutting at nine o'clock in the morning and then you look up and it's, you know, it's dark out. So, and that's what he does, you know, and I would, you know, I constantly am trying to get myself into that headspace because like him, I do it, what I'm doing by, you know, with all that homework in my head and all the studying of the footage, but ultimately I cut by instinct and, and what feels right. And the film background helps too, because having worked on film and and every t every every cut you make is um, there are repercussions if you don't think before you act. Yeah, I mean, in the film you'd, s you'd make splices and you know chop up the work picture, and then when you project it, everybody could see all the all the wrong choices you made, you know, and it would clatter through the gate in a way that the film gate, so that you know everybody would say, well, a lot of changes on that one, you know, and. Um, so it makes you really think, you know, it's like a carpenter, you know, measure twice and cut once or whatever the expression is, you know. So you really have to think about what you're going to do before you do it. And, you know, now with digital, you can't, it, it, you know, I still have that, that same mentality about, you know, thinking carefully and really studying the footage and not just, you know, going through and, you know, making a million cuts for a million d for no reason, you know. Um, I really take every cut, you know, very thoughtful about each cut and why am I cutting and what's the story, what, what's the story of that cut, why am I cutting there? So, and all that's a methodology I learned from cutting on film. And I, you know, try to tell younger editors the same thing that he told me. Um, so, also in terms of dealing with powerful people, um, Billy definitely jumped into the deep end when you first, the first thing you did with Michael Kahn was always, yeah. and it was previews, and Michael didn't even, he was working on the movie, and they were making changes on the cam, and he didn't like to operate the cam, so Billy was just thrust into this situation post-preview, making changes on the cam. Tell, tell the audience who mm. was in the room with you. <laughs> well, I'd only been on the movie for about two weeks, so I didn't know the film very well. I mean, I didn't know the even the film, let alone, let alone all the stuff that wasn't in the film. I didn't know anything about it in two weeks. And I was on the cam uh, making changes into the preview with Steven Spielberg in the room and George Lucas, John Williams, Ben Burt, um, who is the sound guru who did all the sound for Star Wars, uh, Richard Hins, who worked with him, Marty, the head of post at DreamWorks, and I can't, was there other? I mean, that was enough. <laughs> but, and I was literally... I was so nervous that I started to laugh because it was <laughs> like so absurd that I would have to do this not knowing the film and then Steven also and Steven Spielberg and Michael had worked together so long that they had some kind of shorthand that I, you know, that like a married couple would have and, and I would, I couldn't understand a you word. You said it was hieroglyphics Yeah, to they you. would just point and like <laughs> say half a sentence and then nod and go okay and then look at me. 
<laughs> and I would be like, got it, you know? And, and um, so I didn't, I just did what I thought they meant, and I guess I got it right enough that they didn't throw me out of the room. So, and I could operate the camera really fast, so I, you know, that, that was probably impressive, I guess. And, <laughs> and then you had Hook. Hook was quite an experience like that, too, right? A well, lot of talent and ideas in the room. <laughs> <laughs> on Hook, we had, it was crazy, the editing. Dustin Hoffman has, uh, in his contract, he's allowed to look at all his dailies and suggest changes and see the changes. Um, and you don't have to necessarily use them. So, so what we did was we took, I mean, there was so much film in that movie. We put him in a screening room and gave him everything he shot. And it was, you know, it would have taken him a month to watch it all. So he, after about two hours, like, okay, I've seen enough. <laughs> But he came to the cutting room, and I had, we had Dustin, Steven, um, Leah, Marmo, who was one of the writers, and, um, and we were all sort of cutting at the same time. Like Steven with Michael, Dustin with me, one of the other assistants with the, other, with the writer. And it was just like, it was a mad fire drill every day. And at the end of the day, we'd all like plop down on the couch, and like, you know, it felt like a hurricane had come through. Um, and, Dustin Hoffman told he was a he likes to talk likes to tell stories and the thing you when you work for Michael as an assistant you don't talk to anyone but him and even st and when Stephen talks to you you have to sort of say the briefest answer possible and then look away <laughs> um, <laughs> because he doesn't want and, and it was for a good reason because Stephen was such a you know he was such a busy guy or he is such a busy guy and he was so distracted by a million things that he didn't want Stephen distracted for one second in the cutting room. And if that, you know, he'd walk in and go, hey, did you see the US Open this morning? I mean, did you see that 10? And you go, yes. And, then, <laughs> and look away, because if you engage in conversation, that was a conversation where he could have been cutting. You know, he could have been working on the film. So, but it was really hard to manage. You know, you didn't want to be rude to Steven Spielberg, but at the same time, you knew Michael would, you know, shun you if you, if you didn't uh, follow the rules. So <laughs> it was, it was a, a, you know, you really had to watch yourself politically. So the, the next um, big challenge we're going to talk about um, was the, f the first film that you did with Michael Mann. You had relatively little experience before that. You, you got his attention with Citizen X, for which you w were nominated for an Emmy. Um, and this was um, Heat, which is a crime thriller made in 1995. And um, can you talk about how, what, the circumstances under which you were hired and your anxiety attack before you started cutting. And um, <laughs> well, yeah, I had done this movie called Citizen X for HBO that my friend Chris Geralmo wrote and directed. And Michael, I guess, late one night, Michael Mann had watched it on HBO and, not, and he and Chris were friends and he didn't know Chris had written it and directed it, but he saw that, you know, that it was his friend who did it and he really enjoyed the film. And I guess like the editing, so he was looking for an editor on Tom Rolfe, who was you know an incredible editor, um, had to leave the film, and he was looking for somebody to take that place. Although saying I was replacing Tom Rolfe was embarrassing, um, so he and I'm, he saw that film called Chris, and Chris had nice things about me, so he hired me. And in the interview with Michael. I literally didn't, I didn't speak really in the interview. Uh, he t I, talk, I, I was in the, his trailer because it was the last day of shooting on Heat where, when I met him and he spoke for about 40 minutes and I just, I think I said hi and I said, at the end he said, okay, great. Um, is there any other, any, any films in particular of yours I should look at? And I had only done three. So he, I said, no, whatever. And that was all I, <laughs> that was all I said and, they, and he hired me. So obviously based on Chris's recommendation or the way I stared at him, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and I, and I had, like I said, I only done three films, and, and uh, I remember thinking when I saw Robert De Niro and Al Pacino at the Oscars that year presenting an award together, and I thought, and I knew because they were doing the movie, and I thought uh, maybe in 10 years I'll get to work on a movie like that if I'm lucky. And then three months later or whatever, I was on it, and I, I was so anxiety ridden. And the first scene, I think we're going to show the first scene mm -hmm. I cut, and. Um, I sat there for the first day, literally, my heart was pounding so hard in my chest, I couldn't even work. I thought I was gonna uh, hyperventilate and pass out. Um, you know, but then I started to do the, do the job and, and uh, you, know, you get into it and lose yourself in the footage, but it was terrifying. And, and, um, and then, actually, after I cut this sequence, I cut it and then Michael gave me some notes and I recut it and 
and I showed it to him again, and then he, he, at the end of it, he just, all he did was, he banged his hand on the table and said, that's just what I want, and he walked out of the room. And I was just like, wow, that's great. And then I didn't see him for like four days. So I thought, oh, I guess I'm done. I, I didn't know, I thought, I wasn't even sure I was supposed to come in anymore. <laughs> uh, but I was coming, I just came in and sat in my room and kind of ran the scene over and looked at some other scenes, and I didn't know what to do. So I finally like, arranged to bump into him in the hallway and I said, hey, and he went, how are you doing? And I said, is there anything else you want me to do? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and he just had he forgotten just I was there, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but then he gave me, and eventually I inherited a lot of the film, but it was a very strange beginning. <laughs> Can you, and I mean, one of the reasons why people talk about his being such a challenging director to work with is, is he's just kind of, I mean, he, as you said, he, he treats himself the same way. It's not like he slacks off. He, he is a completely, perf you know, um, do you want to talk about, he gives you notes on dailies and the cut footage, and then you have to kind of discern what he means <laughs> and all that. Right, he, he dictates, uh, when he watches the dailies, he dictates uh, notes into a tape recorder, and then those notes are transcribed. And you, s so, you know, there'll be seven takes of, a, of an angle, and, and he'll say, great, good, you know, he'll say a lot of comments, and you have to sort of figure out what he means, you know, because I mean, it's, if you did everything he said in the notes, it would be, you know, unintelligible. So the scenes would be unintelligible. And a lot of what he says is unintelligible, too. He, you know, mumbles into a tape recorder and somebody does their best. I mean, there was a note on... And then he does the same thing with the cut footage. Uh, he'll give you notes. And so there will be, I'm talking five, six binders of notes on cut footage at the end of a movie that are all five inches thick. Um, so you'll have a great screening and then there'll be 20 pages of notes and then they have another screening, and there's 20 pages of notes. And I mean, they're right up to the end. There's never the notes never get less. Um, but there was a note on Heat that said, "Lose the subtle verve," and it was transcribed that way. And I was and I'm showing it to the assistants. And do you have any? Because you don't want to ask, because then he'll just look at you like. Oh. So <laughs> I finally I look at the scene. and I thought I got to figure this out. And I looked at the scene. and I finally said, "Michael, I can't. I just can't figure this out." He goes, "Oh, that's turn the subwoofer down." <laughs> So subtle verve had been interpreted by as sub or sub subwoofer had been interpreted as subtle verve somehow I don't know, um, but uh, the thing that Michael does he's like a scientist you know he has to look at everything from every possible point of view and angle and try every possibility and and that translates into a million hours and that many many twenty four hour days on heat and. 40 hour, 45 hour, my last day was like 46 hour, or two days I guess, it was 46 hours. Um, and at the time it didn't bother me that much because I was single and I, um, I was such a huge break that I, and I was, the f because I came on in the middle of the film, I was much fresher than the other guys. So I, you know, I, kn none of it, I knew what a huge opportunity this was, so I, didn't, I just wanted to take full advantage, so I didn't, uh, I just did whatever he asked and, and never, complained or questioned it and but as the films went on with him I you know I, then I, the insider I was married and then um, Ali I had one kid and then you know I had two kids and then as you get your family expands and your children are growing up and you're missing it it becomes more of a you know uh, a pull on your life in a way that that makes it very difficult I mean that's also why he always has multiple editors because it'd be virtually impossible for everybody to take on that workload single-handedly, right? Yeah. Yeah, he keeps saying, <laughs> you know, oh, the next one, just you, and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's not a good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, th he shoots a tremendous amount of film too. So, uh, and yeah, you'd never be. Able, I mean, he has everybody working those hours, but he just tries wants you to try so many different combinations that there's no way that one person could get all that work done. So gradually it evolves to the point where people take sections and then he becomes the supervising editor in a sense, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, on, on he, the, two, our, the two, well, Heat and, and The Insider were sort of the best possible versions of how he works and the movies, I think, are the best two also. But um, on The Insider, I cut most of the second half of the film and Paul Rebell cut most of the first half, except for a few exceptions, and that was worked really well because you know you get long stretches to go through and it may you know I think there's a continuity there that that otherwise you really are depending on the editor on the director to be the supervising editor and really hold the whole thing together where with a long stretch like that you can you can you know really you know be a shepherd over all of it 
I mean, what's also interesting is to me, th the first thing that comes to my mind is how do you have objectivity if you're, if you're so in the trenches at every moment? But you said in a funny sort of way it taught you objectivity because you are sort of forced to pull back from parts of it and, you know. Well, what would happen is we would screen the movie every day, seven in the morning, every single day. Yeah. So, and then there, but, and you do lose your objectivity and he claims not to, but I know that he does. And, and there'll be days where you can see it more clearly than others, but what happens is if you then skip a day, that's like skipping a week because you're so used to seeing it every day. You, you let, tw if you know, 24 or 36 hours go by, that's a huge amount of time. So it does really, in a strange way, train, train you to be objective faster because it's good to have, like, you know, it would be nice if you could cut, cut something and then put it down for three months and then go back and really you could see it clearly. Um, but doing it like every single day like that, it's, it's you know, you, you get to the point where it just any, any, any gap is a good amount of time and, you've, and you, so you train yourself to be objective. So we're gonna start our first clip and I think you'll f fully appreciate, um, it's such an, a complex, um, ambitious sequence to cut for your first sequence on a movie with Michael Mann. Um, so this is um, 57 minutes into the, f no, this is, I'm sorry, this is two hours and 25 minutes into the movie. Um, now this actually was based, you've, um, you've been called by Jerry Bruckheimer, you were, Bruckheimer, you were called the, um, who's a producer, you were called the story guy, and then, and then you were, somebody called you the tension guy because you did, <laughs> and then I call you the based on a true story guy because <laughs> you did a lot of films based on true stories, which then just happened, I guess, but this was actually based on a real, char real characters, um, mm -hmm. loosely based. Yeah, I think the policeman's name is Chuck Adams. I might, I might be getting that wrong, but there's a real policeman um, that Good. Michael knew that this that Al Pacino's character Vincent Hanna is based on, and then there really was a Neil Macaulay a criminal, uh, and there really was a Wayne Grow who's in the scene. Um, yeah, and I think that I mean, see, this, the, this mo uh, the bulk of the story is made up, but there's ba you know, right. certainly um, Pacino's character is very, very much based on sort of the hyper, the hyper sort of. Uh, you know, diligence that Pacino's character and that sort of obsessiveness that he had is all based on that real person. So, um, would you like to set up the clip as much as they need to know? Oh, this starts on the drive. Yeah. Uh, the drive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is um, right near the end of the film. Basically, De Niro and Amy uh, and Amy Brenneman have gotten away, and they're and they have the money, and they're going to leave. And and John Boyd has set up an escape for him, a plane that he's going to get on on Mark Plane, and and he d he. In giving him the instructions on how to get the plane, he gives him information about where Wayne Grow is, this criminal that double-crossed them, and um, kind of set the whole thing in mo the whole movie in motion, really. Uh, and he and it just it's from that begin that point where he gets that information to the point where he kills Wayne Grow, and um, and then has to leave, you know, and then the police are closing in on him. But it's his h obsessiveness with 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 getting back at this guy. Um, so that's the. Do you remember what the most challenging thing was for you when you were doing that? Um, yeah, the moment, <coughs> pardon me, a couple of things. I mean, the moment where um, the biggest challenge was that when he, when, when De Niro spots the car and sees there's something you know, not right with a girl sitting in a car, and then when, you know, the, the, the moment where De Niro has to leave and realizes that, you know, basically, uh, you know, being who he is and not, and not being able to change kind of, you know, ruin the rest of his life. And uh, you know what we did to get those moments right. All that hopefully seems good here, but uh, you know it seems simple. But getting those moments to play, to play well was incredibly complicated and took a lot of different you know you know experimentation. But also, the, I love the the build up to his making the decision to turn the car around. You can just oh yeah the way <laughs> it just, it's very because it's definitely a build up where you see it. It just you see it in his performance. It's very subtle, but it's definitely happening in his <laughs> eyes and his. Well, yeah. I mean, the advantage of having Robert De Niro uh, <laughs> while you're cutting is you know a, a great one. No, he you know that was the big moment, obviously, where he's he just can't stop. He can't help himself and. And you know, the, there were several different takes, but that one was just you know the, there was the, the moment also where Pacino does a sort of a double take when he sees Amy Brenneman from a distance in that car, and th there's those moments that 
And that's what Michael and we tried to do in all the films in that film, and also very much so in The Insider, was looking for those, I mean, I think it seems simple to say, but to look for those moments that feel so real that you feel like you're watching a real event, you're watching, you're trans, sort of, tra- I mean, Michael would describe it as transcending film, and as you're watching reality and finding those moments and building scenes around them. And yeah. um, and you're talking about the, uh, you love this, spe- that you had a consultant, a special ops person, when, when he, that the, the whole body language of how he mm. attacks the, the guy who went after him after he killed Wayne Grove. Yeah, the guy who, the FBI agent uh, in the hallway who, who says, put your hands up, and then the way is a guy who does a lot of the, a lot of films, his name is Mick Gould, he was a British Secret Service guy, and he trained De Niro and Pacino and Val Kilmer and all the guys in this movie, and and he's done several other movies, Miami Vice as well. He, um, that's a certain tactic, the way he backed up, backed the guy up into a corner where he could feel that the guy had sort of run out of room and they couldn't back up anymore and that's when he turned and attacked him. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a specific way of disarming someone that everything that they've done, they do in this movie is so carefully choreographed to be as real as possible. Um, and the gun, the gun battle on the street, I mean, it was all about, you know, showing the skill of these guys, the, the tactics they use to get out of that situation or try and get out of the situation, and, and the teamwork and the sort of the p- how polished they were as criminals. And it, it's funny, you, you mentioned, on a, actually we were talking about another film, but planned disorientation for an audience. And there is definitely some of that here. I love where you're, you as audience have to kind of find, especially that distance shot, a couple of distance shots where you're, there's a challenge for the audience. It almost makes them more participatory when they're when you're looking at for people through a crowd and and even you know the the, the blurry people passing in front of the characters, but also just the, the 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 opposing distances of the motion of the crowd and trying to orientate yourself to where you are. I mean that's very masterfully done and it, it gives a, a momentum. You know. Yeah, I mean do we. You try and do that in a way, I mean, and I think that's, you know, luckily m- I've gotten to work on films that let you do that. I mean, a, yeah. a lot of times in studio films, they would be like, you know, to make it clearer, you have to make it so, you know, so anybody can, you know, everybody, every single viewer will know exactly what's happening at every single moment of the film. And I think that sort of, you know, this sort of idea of trying to, for lack of a better way to put it, dumb things down, you know, it, it just makes for less interesting films. And luckily, with Michael, he's got you know has the clout to do, or had you know has the clout to do things that are a little more interesting. And and I've so then you say that I w- the, the films I've gotten to work on, uh, I've been lucky enough to work on, seem to be you know I'm lucky enough to be in a position to work on films that let you do that, that let you sort of take chances and make the audience work a little bit and make you know that. I mean, we always say let's make it for the the smartest people, not the dumbest people, so that it's more interesting to audiences and more to more adult audiences. Yeah, no, it, it's great. Um, the next film we're going to show a clip from is an, another Michael Mann film called The Insider, which, which was made in 1999. And this is a true story about a whistleblower in the tobacco industry who appeared on 60 Minutes, and it's a lot about the relationship between the um, 60 Minutes. It's um, Lowell Bergman, who was actually a consultant on the film, and the whistleblower is Jeffrey uh, Weingart. Uh, Wy- Wygand. Wy- Wygand, I mean. Um, and Russell Crowe gave a, a remarkable performance in this movie, um, both of them, but I just think. Um, uh, and um, this particularly brings up. Maybe I know it's true on all Michael Mann movies, but the level of detail and the part of his perfectionism is to make the authenticity, and and this really played out in this because this was a completely true story. It wasn't sort of loosely based on a true story. Um, and I mean, everything is the true. It's Jeffrey Wigand's truth of the story. I right. Mean, there are, and we had to do because of the for legal reasons, we had to make a lot of disclaimers <laughs> about certain things that right. only like there's a scene in the movie where Jeffrey Wigand sees a bullet in the mailbox. Well, that's his word. I mean, we think it happened. I mean, he says it happened, but no one else, no one but he and his, no one, he, but he, he saw that bullet, uh, you know, so there are certain things that we had to put disclaimers on um, t- for legal reasons. And but if you look at footage of the real guy, oh my it's, God, yeah. it's incredible. Um, it's not an impersonation, it's just a spot on 
he's that person. <laughs> yeah, he embodies him well. We got to lucky. Uh, we got to meet uh, a lot of the people that the were were uh, in the film, um, you know, portrayed in the film. And Jeff Wigand, I got to meet a few times, and and watching him and the way he, he just the way he walked, the way he spoke. I mean, Russell had it so perfect, and it like a, not an imitation, but. Just you know, he embodied him in a way that was. You know, I mean, nobody knows what Jeffrey Wigand looks like or 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 sounds like or walks like, but when you're around the guy and you see what Russell did with it, I mean, it was it was incredible. And he was in this film. He was incredible in every take. I mean, he was. And he just gave you a lot of variations, but they were all. Yeah, well, I mean, they did a lot of stuff. Uh, they did a lot of stuff where, and Pacino certainly improvs a lot. I mean, more on Heat than he did on this movie, but. He'll give you a lots of variety of performance, and and what he did, Michael did it. That was interesting on this film is a lot of the phone calls, and there were a lot of phone calls in The Insider, um, and we, you know, Michael would refer to a scene, and say, you know, the phone call, and we'd be like, which, you know, there's <laughs> eleven. Um, so, but a lot of them, he would film them on two different sets simultaneously, and they would actually be on the phone together, and it made those scenes were so electric because of that. And what was interesting about and Mrs. Michael saying this and us realizing it was you can do so many more interesting things in it, or so many interesting things in a conversation uh, uh, you know, with us on the phone editorially because the, they can't see each other. So you can make faces or, the way, you know, uh, uh, or do things that you wouldn't do if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with someone. And it really created all these really fun uh, editing you know, choices that you could make where you, and not, not, it's not a scene we're going to see, but um, where Pacino is so frustrated with Wagan uh, on the phone, and he just, you can see it in his face in a way that he would never do in front of the guy. And it just get, so we, we use that a lot to, to make the phone call scenes much more interesting. And he's, I mean, Pacino, you said he can go from such extremes to whispering to like spitting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the scene in Heat where he comes home and finds that his wife has slept with another guy. And uh, the guy's name is Ralph. And um, th I think take one, he's whispering. Take 12, he's screaming and so much that spit's flying out of his mouth. And he just gives you, and he's in a different place. And he, uh, so it's like pick up performance and go with it because he's in a, you know, matching is out, out the window in terms of he, he just does what he feels. And I mean, I've never spoken to him about it, but he, um, he gives you a lot of variety where um, like Russell, Russell, had a point of view on his performance, and he did it. And you, you know, he he, imp he improvised within that sort of bandwidth that he had selected. But uh, De Niro, same thing. I mean, De Niro, every take would be amazing, but right in the same sort of area that he had right. decided. Where Pacino just gave you everything. <laughs> um, so it, it was, you know, it was really presented. It was fun, but it also presented a lot of challenges. So this particular clip, which is fifty-seven minutes into the film is um, a cat and mouse scene. Um, I'll let you set it up. Well, it's um, Al uh, Lowell Bergman is trying to convince Wigan to go on 60 Minutes, but at the same time letting him know what's going to happen to him if he does. And, and it's all sort of um, a big schmooze to get him to do it. And then, But Jeffrey is really smart and understands what's being done to him. And he sort of, you know, you know d d turns the tables on him. And there's some cutting in here towards the end. And that I particularly like, and and um, you'll know what it is when you see it. When I say turning the tables, but um, and it's just it's a simple dialogue scene, but it, it's uh, I think you know incredible acting and and really sort of uh, encapsulates uh, the relationship in the movie. Yeah. I mean, the cutting what I was referring to is when the you know when we're in a side angle master, and then it's 180 degrees to the other side, and then 180 degrees to the you know again back to the original shot, and. Um, you know, you do things along the way that gain directors of trust, uh, I guess. And I had I took that footage and cut it that way, and I sent it to Michael without knowing that that's why he shot it that way. And I think that you know th that hap that happening makes him think or gives him the feeling that I'm you know I'm in tune with what he's trying to do. And I guess I was. And then there were several things along the way, you know, with Michael where you know we were doing something on heat and. He asked me just to trim a shot, and I, I had done it, and then he was running something on the running the scene on the cam, and he stopped the cam, right where he thought it should cut, and it happened that that was the exact frame I cut on. He said, "Cut it here," and I said, "I mean, he rolled it one frame, and that was you know I, I did," and so the idea that I had picked the same frame as him or had intuited that, 
that uh, style of cutting he wanted to do there, I think you know those those things really made you know us sort of feel like we were in sync. But I also that's interesting when you talked about the challenge of how it was covered in terms of um, performance and lens size and the and the move in and trying to match it. Can you well, yeah, the heat, every every take in that scene is a B camera, a camera on one side on a, you know, over Russell and Al, and the B camera over Al and Russell, and. Um, they would the cameras would slowly push in on every take, but at different speeds. So, intercutting the takes and making it, you know, you would cut around and want to change performance, and then the camera would jump back and it would look awkward. So, figuring out a way to make the, the, the puzzle of making that all to go together and have the performance and have everything match. I mean, I don't. I mean, hopefully you don't see it. I mean, there's so many mismatches in that that scene with Al. I mean, I just see them and I want to throw myself on the ground. But <laughs> um, hopefully you don't. I don't know. Um, because he was doing, Pacino had a, a lot of trouble with that scene, and he was, his hands were up, his hands were down, his, you know, drinking at different time. I mean, he was just doing everything different in every take and making it look right. It was really challenging. And he, there were several scenes in this film, I think he had a problem uh, sort of finding the character in certain scenes. And in this scene, he would go up, you know, like forget where he was or not feel it, or and, and he the camera would be rolling and he would just, lay his head down on the table and Michael being respectful to him as an actor would just sort of wait and it would be a long time I mean 30 seconds with his head down and you hear Michael off camera saying Al Al are you okay and then he would pop up really like Rah, and then and continue into the into the scene out of nowhere it was really an editor's nightmare well I mean <laughs> it was fun to watch I mean <laughs> it was um, the other thing it was I, I thought it was interesting when you chose to go in close for the first time, um, when he says, is that why you became a journalist? It's like the, there's a hint of things to come. It's like the, t the attacking is just about to start where the tables get turned. And it, it is, they become each other in a way. They switch, it's very interesting. It's what's interesting about that film is they sort of, yeah. they each takes the other other's sort of personality. And, and I think, and they're both very much like Michael. Um, and I think that's probably why this is sort of, to me, his best film is because both of the lead guys are exactly like him. And he often sort of, you know, I think Michael thought that he and Muhammad Ali were sort of the same person at a certain point. They, they kind of, Will is very much, um, because Michael grew up in Chicago uh, during in the 60s when I th at a time where, um, you know, he was had sort of the same political beliefs that Ali did and, and Ali lived in Chicago for a long time. And, and I think Michael really saw a lot of similarities. I don't know if Ali feels that way, but Mi but Michael did, and so I mean, a lot of Will's performance in that movie is very much sort of a mirror of Michael. Um. But the the Russell Crowe character too, you just feel there's so much about just about to burst under the scene. I mean, you capture that, and it's it's subtle. I mean, there, but you just feel it happening. You feel his anger building, and it's a very well, yeah, I mean, that, the film, the, that film, whole film is sort of built on its subtleties and, you know, every, and that's what, I mean, Michael used to refer to it as like, it's like Mercury, you know, finding, I mean, we, we would do things in that film and change one line or a couple of lines of a scene here or there and we'd watch the film and it was like, why does the whole thing fall hell apart? And, you know, it's like when you try and move Mercury around and like one thing comes out the other side, you know, you can't, it, it, this film was so, and these dr dramas like this are so sensitive to just one little nudge and you send things completely in the wrong direction. So the editing was a really an, an intense experience. And, um, and you know, we were painstaking about finding just those, right, those moments you're talking about and, but then how to string them together into a scene. You know, you'd find these phenomenal moments, but how do you make them into like a, a you know, a complete narrative and, you know, into a story. And it took, you know, hours and hours and hours and, you know, hundreds of revisions. Right. I think I was up to seeing like a version 112 or something on that scene. Oh, my God. Somewhere over 100, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next film we're going to talk about was, is Seabiscuit, which is also based on a true story, um, um, based on a book as well, uh, 2003. And this was the second film you had done with Gary Ross, first Pleasantville. And I think it's interesting in terms of editors working with directors and trust and how that happens over time. And you talked about on Pleasantville, he was sort of in the cutting room, like four frames here, four frames there. And then he, I mean, the perfect balance is to get that input. But sometimes you want to try things and be alone to make mistakes or just to think. And that 
he gave you more freedom on this film. To I mean, Pleasant was also his first film. So, I mean, right. we, it was the first time we worked together, his first film. And I think he became, by the time we did Seabiscuit, even though it was only a second film, he was much more comfortable with himself as a director, m knew me much better, and knew that I knew what I was doing, I guess. And he had a lot more, gave me a lot more freedom and um, trusted my instincts more. And I, so I think he felt like maybe he, although I think Pleasantville is a, a really great film, I think he felt like maybe he micromanaged it too much. I mean, I may be speaking for him, but um, where he felt like if he just took one little step back and had a, a clearer view of the big picture that it would help the film, and I think it did. Um, and, and this this scene is my favorite scene in the film, and um, you know, uh, it's sort of its own little short film, really, and it's just, it came together so beautifully, and it was an amazing day in my life, too, because I was there when they filmed it, and uh, there were 7,000 extras, all in period costumes, and um, my wife's family was there. It was a, it was a, a Keeneland uh, racetrack in Kentucky, and it was just, and it was an incredible day, and it, it came out, that, you know, as better than I could have ever hoped. Um, the thing that's interesting about this is when Seabiscuit wins at the end, um, they couldn't. Oh, you just. Uh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he wins. Um, <laughs> uh, so when Seabiscuit wins at the end, they they were they were shot that that section of the of the race. They shoot the you know race in continuity, and they shot that section of the race last. And they couldn't get. I mean, horses are horses. You know, you can't you know give them direction. They they're gonna do what they're gonna do. And Seabiscuit kept losing. Um, <laughs> And they were running out of takes, and then he ran. He, and then he he finally got him to win, but he only won by like one lane. He ra it wanted to be we wanted to be completely accurate, and I, I can't remember if it was four or seven lengths. I can't remember the exact amount, but we couldn't. We were talking about how to do this, like we were running out of light, and you can only run horses a certain amount of times, and then you have to change horses, and it takes a long time. And so finally. They ran one take the with the War Admiral horse as a instead of using a thoroughbred which kept beating Seabiscuit, they used a lead pony which is basically not you know is like way down on the horse scale and uh, that's the only way they could get Seabiscuit to win. But in, in <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you can't make a horse you can't you can't hold a horse back with and have it look right you know because they do something when they. Um, when they're riding and they're just like on the back stretch, they do something called rating, which is, and you see that their arms don't move very much, the jockey's arms. And then when they are, want the thing to run full out, they're doing what's called asking and their arms are flinging back and forth. So there's no way to fake that on a horse. So, and these happened for us, that was great about this was that George Wolf is played by Gary Stevens, who's a world-class Hall of Fame jockey, and Chris McCarron is riding War Admiral, and he's also a Hall of Fame jockey, so we had, two amazing jockeys so you could do anything with the camera that you wanted to and really like get in there and like see that these guys are riding and do everything you wanted to do where with Toby, you know, you can't put an actor on a thoroughbred and run him at 40 miles an hour and expect him to live, expect him to live. So, um, <laughs> uh, and, s and so a lot of the races with Toby, there's head replacements and, you know, doubles and things like that. So this gave us, you could do anything and it was really fun. And could you talk about how you shot, the, they shot the crowds crowd reactions? I mean, the, the principals reacting Oh, well, yeah. Um, uh, Elizabeth Banks, who is so great, this, so much of this scene is great because of Elizabeth and her reactions and how, in, you know, how intense she is and how into it she is and how real she is. And there's one particular tag, I'm not sure if it's the one we use, where she got so excited when she jumped up when Seabiscuit won that she punched um, Jeff Daniels, uh, Jeff, Jeff, sorry, Jeff Bridges in the nose and he had a completely bloody nose from... Uh, from her, she was just so uh, excited about it that, that you know that uh, poor Jeff had blood all over him. And, and they had st a st oh right, right the um, um, the way they would do the crowd reactions in a lot of the races because you couldn't you didn't want to run the horses when you couldn't see them and they were on camera. The uh, first assistant director would take a, uh, a stick with a big paper plate on the end of it and then he would run down the uh, <laughs> down the back stretch down the back the home stretch with uh, on the thing and then that's what they, that's what they're reacting to not not the horses so. <laughs> Try and forget about that when you watch the scene. But but I also think it was interesting. Um, Gary Ross said that you know um, that everything, the key to a an action sequence is story, not the moment of action for the sake of it. And everything you know that you it is everything is the excitement is obviously the horses are exciting, but it's through their eyes, and you really accomplish that in this. Yeah, scene. I mean the big the big story in this scene is. 
you know, they have a plan that is, and the way Seabiscuit would run, and this is true, that he would, you had to get him to look the other horse in the eye, that he would take the challenge, you know, Seabiscuit would take the challenge personally. And so they come up with this plan that they're going to, they train Seabiscuit to react to this bell. You know, at night they would just train him, like you know, like Pavlov's dog, to jump and get him out in front, and and so it worked. And they get he he gets out in front, but then the plan is to let C let War Admiral catch up, and then so Seabiscuit can get face to face with him and look look right at him, and then you know he'll be able to win that way. And and you know it's a huge risk to take. This this race, I mean. Horse racing is not as big as it was, but the entire country stopped when this happened. I mean, this was a depression too. It was. A yeah, I mean, horse racing was a huge thing. Seabiscuit had become, you know, a hero to the to people during the depression. He, he was a you know a national figure, and and literally the country stopped when this when this race. It was the biggest the biggest event, uh, you know, uh, that could have possibly been, ha been happening. And so the idea that this was gonna this plan was gonna work or not work was the was sort of the crux of the scene. And what we're trying to do is make this. Will in the tension of will the plan work, and and that was the story. So that's and what Gary's saying is true. I mean, you can have a phenomenal action scene with a lot, all the best stunts and all the best you know action bits, but if if there's no story and it's just watching a bunch of crashing around, then the audience will be disengaged. So, I mean, Gary was great about every single race had its own little story, so that it you never felt like oh here comes another race, you know, because it was always about something and about the characters. And the peculiarity of this race, they're not coming out of the gate. That was that was a, a demand that the, the other horse owner made. Right. Uh, War you Admiral said you could do a whole film on all the... Yeah, I mean, War <laughs> Admiral, I mean, the whole sort of way they got this thing to happen, it, I can, uh, can't remember the, guy, the owner of War Admiral's name, but the, you know, the guy, he, he kind of, it was an East Coast horse versus a West Coast horse, and the East Coast really looked out on the West Coast horses, and um, just... Of course they did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to get, um, just to get him to, to agree to their match race was this huge press tour that it's all in the film. But that Charles Howard went all over the country, sort of drumming up, you know, uh, support for this race, so that the owner of War Admiral had no choice but to race him. But I guess in the East Coast, they didn't. The starting gates weren't used everywhere, so the only way he would agree to it was by a what they would call a rope start. And um, so that's what that's what we see here. I'm, I don't know where we're starting this clip, but I think it's in there, right? Yeah, it's it's where you see that. Start. Yeah, I mean, I, I I get emotional when I see that. Every time <laughs> I see that, <laughs> um, actually, mo I'm sp I ran this clip a couple of about like a month ago at this thing I did, and everybody in the audience burst into applause when Seabiscuit won. I was just like, <laughs> after all, um, you know, it's I don't know, it just that's uh, all sort of came together in a, in the way sort of I, I in the way I had, ima I had imagined it when when I read the screenplay. That last master shot, you want to talk about that? Oh, you know, there's that wide shot at the very end where there's an imperfect imperfection in the camera move. You know, it's sort of, the camera sort of readjusts and uh, I don't know, snaps in a little bit and gets it to be a tighter size. And, um, and Gary wanted to trim that part off, you know, the director. And I was like, well, no, that's, that's I use that on purpose because it gives it sort of a, 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 an immediacy and sort of an alive feeling that, you know, the sort of mis fortunate mistakes. You know, and and we d we did a lot. I've done a lot of that with Michael, with Michael Mann, and I've I've done a lot of did a lot of that with Argo. You know, just it it gives the film a, a sort of visceral, alive kind of feeling where, um, you know, that it feels I don't know, unplanned and and real. And um, you know, Alan Heim, uh, who's <laughs> a you know famous editor who cut for Bob Fosse, you know, asked me about that same thing, <laughs> and everybody seems to be obsessed with that one. At one little moment, but I, I that's again. That's why we I included it. Yeah, that's why. I mean, that's kind of why I used it, and I thought, oh well, maybe I, I, I'm still maybe that was a mistake. I don't know, but um, uh, you know, I'm l looking for stuff that f again feels real and alive, and 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 like you know, edgy, and and uh, so I just look for moments that feel that way, and that 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 reached out to me. I also thought that was a really nervy thing to do, going back to the people listening to the radio at that very crucial point, and it worked. But were you nervous about Yeah, and, and that's, actually, that's actually Gary Ross's voice as the track announcer, because uh, nobody could, he, he did it on the day, and we could never get it any, anybody to do it any better, so we just used it. But, um, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I assume that everybody's seen Seabiscuit, maybe not, but uh, through the course of the film, we're constantly, we've cut several times to these black and white still sequences to give 
the audience a feeling of what was happening at the time, you know, ha give it context as to what was happening in the country. And um, Gary just came up with that idea as a way to show, you know, how, you know, everybody was huddled around, the, uh, everybody across the country was huddled around the radio listening to that broadcast. And it was sort of, you know, just as they were about to see the start of this amazing race cut away from it, you know, it's, and it's very unexpected. So I think it works on a lot of different levels. Yeah, it's really interesting, but brave. I mean, an unusual choice. I yeah, it was also it. like, I think part of it was, oh, we don't have to film the whole race, you know, because, yeah. because you didn't have to film the whole first stretch. I mean, you don't realize when you're until you're standing on a racetrack how big it is and how hard it is to film and uh, th film the races. And like I said, you can only run a horse like a, I think it's three times, like uh, short pieces of the race three times, and then you have to change the horses out. So and it takes a long time to do that. So to get these races filmed was a really in incredible, ex you know, uh, achievement to to get them just to get them on film and then to make them as good as they are is, is really special because. Uh, when you're watching them do it and you, know, you have a limited amount of daylight and um, we're shooting at Santa Anita uh, uh, for most, not this race, but most of the races, you, we had limited days and we had to stop at four o'clock every day. And it was, and, they, and then they couldn't go over on the filming because the real, what they call meet, you know, the, the season, the horse racing season was gonna start. So they had to get it all done in a certain amount of time. And it's just a an Herculean ex uh, um, thing to get it all done. Yeah. Um. It was great. Um, so next, we're going to talk about Argo, um, which was made in 2012. And it was actually the third film that Ben Affleck directed and the second film you had done with him. You had done his first film, Gone Baby Gone. Gone, Baby Gone. And um, so uh, this is a historical thriller about a CIA operative, Tony Mendez, who um, rescued diplomats from Tehran during the 1979 hostage crisis. Um, so you, did you find a difference in your working relationship or, or the nature of how you worked together with Affleck in, um, from the first to the third? You know, the, he, he had gotten more mature as a director, but our relationship was great on Gone Baby Gone. I mean, we really hit it off as people, and he's very easy to get along with. He's a really nice guy. He's very smart, and he's a lot of fun, too. So it was a really, f both films were really fun experiences. But he certainly got more confident as a director. You know, I think he would you know, agree with me. I mean, he got more confident as a, st a storyteller with the camera, understanding, you know, how, how to, you know, not just point the camera at something, but to really uh, use it as part of the story. Um, so, I mean, he was much, much more confident, and he was much more confident sort of editorially as well. I mean, on, on, on Gone Baby Gone, I was constantly, you know, we were, the film was a bit long, and I kept, I was constantly pushing him to make it shorter, because I felt like it wasn't quite there yet in terms of the pace, and he would always call me the length police, you know, um, and be like, kind of, not really annoyed, but sort of, um, I guess how much I was pushing him to, to, to tighten it. And, and then, but on Argo, the sort of the roles were reversed. He was actually way more attentive to the pace and, and, than, than even I was, which is, you know, because I'm always concerned about it. But he was really on top of it in a way that, that I could see where he understood, you know, that a thriller like this really had to be just, you know, every, everything had to be perfect. The pace of it, it just had to be perfect and really cranked down in terms of, you know, no fat, so that it would, you know, you'd never let the audience off the edge of their seat. But the reverse was that you, he was nervous about the mixture of archival footage and footage he shot, and you were not, you reassured him and said, if they're involved, it will not be a problem. Yeah, I mean, w you know, strangely enough, a lesson I learned on the third Transformers movie, um, because in the beginning of that film is the, you know, they show the moon landing and how the aliens, you know, were involved, of course, you, in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> and we took a lot of archival footage of the moon landing and the, the, the lift off and the landing and the whole thing and mix it in with stuff Michael shot and it, the aspect ratio would change and the quality of the image would change and, and it just didn't matter because I, the, uh, it's a really engaging sequence and the audience is just with you. And so when the size, you know, the, the, the size of the film come, you know, shrink in and get wider because you're changing aspect ratios. Nobody even noticed it. Nobody even, no, no one cared. I mean, it was just, it was interesting and engaging. And so when, when um, Ben shot all these different formats, especially for the, uh, em the uh, embassy takeover in the beginning, he had eight millimeter film, 16 millimeter film, a 35 millimeter film, and it was all sort of, you know, all mixed together. It didn't matter. Um, and he shot, 
he shot everything in Iran on uh, on two per or uh, three perf film, which made it look grainier, and used a stock to make it look grainier. Shot everything in the sort of in the CIA section with a lot of steady cams, and a completely different look. And he shot everything in the Hollywood section with something to si simulate what was, would be color reversal. So it had a little more poppy kind of, you know, Hollywood kind of look. And and uh, he was really sort of nervous about combining all those different formats. And I was like, why? I mean, the films, you know. Stories engaging. They're with the characters. They don't care. It's just part of it. It's part of the you know the, the tapestry of the film, and that, that's and it, it worked in our favor. And originally in the script, it was actually it, he did it differently because when he's the embassy takeover, which we're not showing this, but we're, we can talk about. Yeah. Um, when he scales the wall, and then there was going to be a 180 around, and then it was going to go from archival right. to right. I mean, originally we were going to as we did through in, so the rest of the film is a bunch of archival footage. It's real archival footage. In the um, the way it's written in the script is that you're in the archival shot of the guy, you know, the, the, the students first jumping over the wall of the embassy, and then we were going to come around to the other side and see the si see the angle we that we never saw in the '80s. Or, um, but what happened was um, Ben and Rodrigo Pareto, the DP, and uh, some of the extras had all had hand had cameras and. Um, they were walking around in the crowd, and they shot. Basically, we shot our own archival footage, and the stuff that we shot, or we they shot, um, was so great that we just never used the other stuff because it was just like it, er, so many people. When I talk about the film, think it is archival footage. I honestly, it really does. Some of it, it looks like both. It looks. Some of it really looks. I can't. I. I thought. I was going to ask you, are you sure? No, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah not, nothing in the, uh, in the embassy takeover is, is archival at all. all but you said you, st you studied the actual newsreel footage to see how organized they were and like just get a sense of what the reality was for yourself when you were... Yeah, I mean, the, the way that the whole event was organized in terms of when it really happened, it was a much... It, w it was an organized thing. I mean, it was they had signals to it, you know, there were signals that were given to when to go and jump the wall and it was it was a, an organized event and we shot a lot of that and then at the end of the day we decided to make it just more of a visceral sort of you know thing you know things happening cascading and you know in a in a feeling of what it would be like to be there and like this sort of reality of you know you're never sure about what's about to happen and, and it just you know sort of jagged edge cuts and making set jagged sound cuts and making it really visceral and not being so descriptive about the ABCs of it. And w when you've talked about your overall challenge in making this film, you said your biggest challenge is t was tone, because you have the sat satirical comedy elements, you have terribly upsetting dramatic things, archival. You know. Yeah, we have, well, we had, I mean, the biggest thing was the comedy, obviously, yeah. and making that fit in the right bandwidth with the rest of the film. I mean, you have a a character piece and you know a, a human drama and you have a tension you know kind of thriller element so combining those all into one uh, one sequence that r or combining them all into one feeling one film that that fit together was you know we were terrified it wouldn't work so there's one sequence in the film where there's a script read through which we're going to show which we're about to show apparently um, <laughs> and um uh, the, when we put that film, that sequence together, because it sort of combined all those different elements in one sequence, and uh, along with with archival footage, and when we saw that together and saw that it worked, it, felt it was like a, a huge sigh of relief from, uh, from everybody on the film, certainly Ben and I, because we felt like this can all go together and work. If this works. Yeah, if this works, then the film as a whole will work, because it's sort of a microcosm of the whole film. So this is about. 39 minutes into it, and this is the script read through. And I mean, we can talk about it later, but there are so many different elements, and you'll see how tricky it was to combine comedic and dramatic. Um. <laughs> I noticed how you front loaded the comedy with the table read so that as they continued the table read, but then it you took out the <laughs> you Well, yeah, I mean, it gets to be pretty serious, but yeah, um, yeah. the sort of mock execution and. and um, you know, it's interesting. It's the film. It really, this scene really illustrates sort of the whole. One of the big themes of the film is the storytelling. You know, the storytelling of the media. This, this, you know, and the presentation of what was happening, as you know, the stories we tell each other, the stories we tell our children, the story of the media, the stories the media is telling to you know, to about what's happening, and it, all these, all those things are sort of combined in, the, in that sequence, which is nice. And you said that the Mox execution was 
so beautifully shot and maybe more elaborate than in the script and you yeah, framed everything around yeah, it. Yeah, we sort of ended up framing that, a big part of it around that because, uh, and, and the, the real hostages that were, that were in the embassy, because I mean, that really did happen uh, to them. And, and it, when Ben shot that part, it was much more elaborate than he had originally planned. So it became, and it's, it's so gut-wrenching when you watch it, um, it just became the centerpiece of the sequence, you know, by sort of virtue of the fact of how engaging it was. And did you, you said some of it was just totally too hard edge. some of the transitions, did you, was that a lot of redoing just to get it? I so worked really hard on that yeah. scene, um, and when I did it, the first, I mean, I, I wish my assistant were here to tell you how, you know, I was tearing my hair out of my head. Um, I worked on it for, you know, a good two days, and then sat down and watched it with a couple of my assistants, and I just hated it. The, and then I just, again, I almost started, not I started over, but I, I went and, and almost redid the entire thing because I just didn't, and, and it doesn't have, I mean, usually there's something about a sequence that I like after I do it, but this one, I, 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 because I knew how important it was to get it right, and I worked incredibly hard and, you know, revised it m probably more times than I would normally do a sequence uh, before I show it to the director because I just couldn't figure out, like, how to, you know, how to get it combine all those elements and, and, and make it, you know, cohesive and telling the same story. You really did a beautiful job. I mean, it's incredible sequence. Um, so we're going to show another sequence from Argo, and this is um, much later. It's an hour and 23 minutes into it. Um, w it starts with the, the, hos the, um, the people that are at the embassy, the, not the embassy takeover, but the Canadian embassy, um, home of a Canadian ambassador. And um, it was interesting when they were shooting that because the, the people actually lived together for a week without any outside input. And there was a, some improv maybe or some... Well, not this particular... S what, not what, this sequence. Well, not this sequence. But what Ben did with the, with the actors that were all the house guests, um, he put them in, the ha in a house. Uh, the house is actually in Hancock Park in California that they shot this in. But um, he put them in, a, in the house for a week together where they lived with, no, with only sort of what was available you know, during the time it happened. So there were no cell phones. Only they could only watch movies of that were uh, you know, being released around that time. They had books and magazines from that time. And uh, they dressed in their costumes. They did the whole thing. And they lived together for a week to get them to get a familiarity um, with all of them so that when they actually acted you know, in, the, in the film that there would be that sort of second, second hand or second nature kind of conversations. And, and they all sort of had their different political roles that, you know, in terms of what they believed, what each, a what each character believed. And, and the actors sort of took on those roles and they shot a lot of improv stuff, a lot of political discussion. Some of it's in the film, earlier in the film, but um, but it was just sort of to get the feeling of the time that, you know, everybody had a different point of view about, you know, about the Shah and, and what he was doing and, and sort of, and, and the Ayatollah and, and, and what was happening politically. So um, it really lent to an authenticity w when they shot the film. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't know that I mean, it's a, just a great idea. But the other thing is, and this, this has to do with the clip we're showing, it, which involves a drive to the airport, that you said that you decided to change your focus more to the people in, in the van, in the car, because they so beautifully underplayed it, and the driving around with exterior shots of the van didn't seem as compelling to you when you were putting it together. Yeah, I mean, we, there was a lot more exteriors they shot of that uh, Volkswagen bus going through the streets of Tehran. I shot it in Turkey, but, um, and, and so it was, m it sort of took the tension away to, to be ex exterior right. of the van. And there's a couple of shots in there, but, you know, I was, I, again, as an editor, you so benefit from the performances of these incredible actors that, you know, they, they just have a way of showing tension on their face without overplaying it and feeling like you can just feel their jaws grinding together um, in a way that really makes the film tense. So finding, you know, those, those moments and finding, figuring out a way to put them together to tell a cohesive story is my job, but they, you know, get me so, you know, they get, us, get me so far along the road by just being, you know, by giving me great performance. I also thought, I don't know if it's true, but yeah, I know that, that All the President's Men was um, a inspiration when this film was made. I think you said Zero Dark Thirty Two. Right, the look of the, the, well, look. the, the look of the CIA pit. Like and the, I think you'll see it in this sequence, Yeah, actually, that's yeah. very much modeled on uh, All the President's Men, which I think a lot of films are, because it's such a, it's such a great film. But 
Um, yeah, there were about, I guess about eight or ten films that Ben sent a list out before, before he shot the film. He sent us all a list of about eight or ten films and, he was, and for us to watch. Um, these films are uh, apply to the to the um, the embassy takeover. Um, these films apply to this part, you know, and so we all had a feeling of what he was trying to do so cinematically before we started on the film. So, and it really helped, you know, um, get you into the right mindset of, of, of what he was trying to get to. So we're going to show it now. Uh, uh, the thing that attracted me about that scene when I read it was the sort of jumbling around of time, you know, he's Ben giving the instruct or Tony giving the instructions about what's going to happen as we're already on the road to the airport. I thought that was really an interesting editorial challenge and it, it really attracted me. It was one of the things I really loved about the script um, was those opportunities. And uh, the shot at the end there when Ben looks up to the sky, you know, sort of thanking God, I guess, but we were so careful about being subtle in the film, being everything being really underplayed, that I would, you know, I saw that piece and I was like, oh, I can't put that in. And and then Ben was like, why didn't you use that? And I was like, I thought, you know, I thought you were you know, staying away from anything like that. But it gets a great reaction, so he's clearly right. Well, because it's so underplayed before that, that it just, it's almost like you have to have that little. A little bit. exhale, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next film we're going to talk about is Zero Dark Thirty, also made in 2012. Uh, this is um, based on a decade, a true story, again. <laughs> Decades-long manhunt that focuses on a CIA intelligence analyst, um, Maya, played by Jessica Chastain. Um, and um, the story was actually unfolding as they were writing it, not shooting it, right? It, when well, Bin Laden I mean, was captured. Wh this what happened was they were about to make a film about the mission in Tora Bora where Bin Laden got away. And while they were in the middle of writing, or Mark Ball was in the middle of writing it, Bin Laden was killed, so they had to do it over. Um, so they wrote it, they actually wrote, he, Mark wrote the script really fast and, and got it up and, and they got it up and running really quickly. Um, you know, so. And when you got hired, you said you didn't even know that Maya was a, a character in the story, right? Well, you I mean, they really kept what Jessica, uh, Jessica Chastain's part, and everybody knew she was in the movie, but no one really knew exactly what role she had and they really kept it under wraps and tried to do that even up to the release of the film as part of it we never no one we never previewed Zero Dark Thirty in fact no one I think about 12 people was the most in one, at one time who saw it and probably there were under 50 that saw it the entire making of the film which is very unusual to do for a film that, 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 that scale but we were so worried about sort of ever people finding out what the plot of the film was and then also there was all the politics that went along with this film that we just didn't you know, uh, want to invite that in yet. And she, I mean, Catherine Bigelow did make a point that she said the, was to immerse the audience in this landscape and not to debate policy and that was the intent of the film. Um, so, um, and you made a point that I have to make sure I mention today, which is, great. Um, there were no friends and family screenings. There were no previews. And particularly when you see the sequence we're going to show, which is the end of the hunt for Bin Laden, the raid. Um, if this had been previewed, they would have ruined it. Because, I mean, all the subtleties and ambiguities that are so beautiful about this sequence and the film in general, you know, um, and, and Billy made the point of, um, why are so many indie movies nominated for Oscars? Well, maybe because they don't, a lot of them don't preview. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, this whole thing of dumbing, dumbing films down and, and getting too many notes. And I think the fact, I think there was a lot of power in, in being on your own and, you know, doing it that way, you know? Well, I mean, there's certainly a film like this where there's a million names, you know, and they're all, you know, names that are very difficult to pronounce, let alone remember. Um, it was certainly would have been a studio note to, to put, you know, Chirons on the screen and identify who everybody was and, and do things to make things clearer. And I'm sure that the raid, which we're about to see a piece of, um, which parts of it are very, very dark. Um, you can talk about your nervous breakdown. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I got hired to do this film again in the middle because the, he, she, there were two million, or the equivalent of two million feet of film on this like 370 hours, I think, of film. Um, she shot four, five, six cameras running basically continuously. Basically on, on everything. Document, mm. cinema verite style, so there was no traditional coverage and just... Yeah, no masters. It no was masters. all just, I mean, as the one of the actors said, 
we never had to find the camera. The camera found us because and it's had everything feels immediate and real and very documentary like. Um, I mean, the raid had 40 hours of, of dailies, and it took me six, six weeks, f about 14 hours a day, six days a week, just to put it in the first cut. Um, so I got hired in the middle, uh, right at the end of shooting, and the first thing I had to do was the raid, and um, they sent me to get me, sort of, they wanted me to get, to get going as fast as possible because they were in a hurry, and they sent me all these dailies on a hard drive from Jordan where they were shooting, of dailies from the raid, and I put them on my laptop and started looking at them, and it was black. And I thought, and then occasionally there'd be a shot in night vision where I would see something, or there'd be a gunshot, and I would see a flash of a soldier. And I thought, oh my God, I mean, I, I, I don't know what, this is all black. It's not, I don't know how I'm going to cut it. I can't even see it. Um, and, you know, it was just because I didn't realize what they were doing. I mean, how, what you know, how, what the what style they were going for, and what they were trying, the reality they were trying to achieve. I mean, there was no lights on the set. There was some overhanging lights on some of it, some soft lights. But basically, they wanted it to be what it was like there, pitch black, and only seeing shadows and outlines. And then that was highlighted <coughs> by these night vision shots, which gave you context and gave you orientation about what was happening. So to put you right in the in the in the compound with the seals, the, and it was a choice. But and once I got into the editing room, where I was able to black it out so dark that you, I literally couldn't see my hands in front of me, um, or the keyboard for that matter, on the on the Avid. So I had to get a special light with this little red light on it that, that hung over my keyboard, so I could see the because I would be f like feeling around for it on the table, and I couldn't find it, so I needed a little tiny light. But um, and then, you know, uh, even through all the, the entire post process and the color timing, Catherine actually, she wanted to make it darker, but um, even darker than it is in the film. And, and the color timer was just refused to let her, you know. <laughs> she, she kept, he kept, he was uh, good for him too, because some of the helicopter stuff, he, she was like, no, no, darker, darker. I was like, I can't even see the helicopter. You gotta be able to see something. And um, so I think we were able to achieve the right balance. And, but we, I was so terrified because we were in sort of laboratory conditions and we could see everything when we finished the film and I kept saying well what happens when we go into the field you know like what happens when we release this movie into regular theaters or as you know they don't run the projector lamps as bright as we do I mean we're going to be able to see anything so we went out into Century City and rented a theater for the day and ran ran the film at all different light levels and to make sure that we could still you know, see this stuff, and thank God. I mean, I was so terrified that we were going to be like, oh, well, better start over, you know, with the color timing, because you can't see anything once you dip below a certain level, but it, it held up, so we were very fortunate. But it was also interesting, because she always sh shot the night vision, which is license. It's actually nobody's point of view, except maybe once um, or twice. Yeah. But the way you decided to, every once in a while, orient the audience, but just, it, you said it's like being in a haunted house. Like, it, there was this suspense, but there was also something so interesting about you, which you don't fully see because we couldn't use long enough a clip to show this, but the lead into this is this really interesting a cow sound or these weird mundane sounds that make you feel the ordinariness and the complete unordinariness of it. There was this interesting line you walked, even, well, when Bin Laden is shot, you'll s I mean, if you've seen the movie, but you'll see now, is, is there something anticlimactic, climatic, and ordinary. It's very an interest. I mean, you achieve this incredible balance, you know? Well, it was just a feeling of when the audience was, you know, had been, it was so much in the dark, you just got to give them a glimpse of where they are. And, and it, it was in a way to make you feel like you don't know what's around the corner. I mean, the sort of, uh, and the attention to detail and to every little move they made and how organized and how methodical the seals were and how professional they were and showing all that detail and, but at the same time, never knowing if somebody, you know, is going to be somewhere with a gun around the corner or just another corner, and and all the real sounds and no music and just you know, night sounds, no just music. Yeah. yeah, because we tried a little music and it was just we tried to also underplay this as much as possible because of the event itself and not make you know be as you know first of all, it's true to what actually happened as we w knew, although it seems like every day there's information <laughs> that comes out that. You know, this last story we heard was un completely untrue, and there's a different version. So, um, but in terms of the what happened in that compound, I think we're pretty close to what happened. But the other thing, that the mundane part of, or the anticlimactic, is that it's just another day for the Navy SEALs. They did 10 mis 12 missions that day or there something. There were a lot it's of other missions that night. I mean, for them, it's just another, 
it's their job, and that's what they do, and they do it carefully and correctly, and and um, and we're also trying to show that. But it, it's it's very different than the tension in Argo, which is more sort of a Hollywood kind of idea of yeah. tension, and you know, cut like I said earlier, cutting out you know just the right moments and just building and building and building. And this was sort of tension through you know detail and just you know making it so calm and so sort of detail oriented that when something did happen it was so shocking and but uh, but also in a in a very real way and um and that's a credit to the way Catherine shot it. i mean she shot like i said the whole she shot the whole sequence you know in the very very low light conditions and then she would shoot the whole sequence again with the night vision lenses on the camera so she had to do everything twice and you know the great thing about her is um if she trusts you as an editor you just it's like here's the film edit it you know and then she would and she has a way of communicating her notes almost telepathically where she uh doesn't say much but you know exactly what she wants you and said she says like a million things in a few words yeah just like three <laughs> words and then you it's like you know the equivalent of a binder full of michael mann notes i was gonna um, say <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Your range uh, of experience. Well, I mean, so it was really, I mean, there are sequences in this film, I and mean, uh, like I said, 40 hours on this raid scene, there was a sequence in the film where they find the white van, uh, SUV that the courier's driving around, and it took me three days to watch the dailies, and just to watch the dailies, and then, you know, another day and a half or so to cut it, and it was just one three-minute section in the film. I mean, it was an overwhelming amount of material, but what it made me do, because we were sort of on a tight schedule, was make a lot of decisions and just stick to them. It was like really not, like make decisions very quickly and very definitively and use what I thought were the best pieces and just go. Because there's so much footage and there's so, I mean, I, I could make a whole nother movie about, you know, the history of Pakistan, I mean, based on all the footage we have. I mean, it's just incredible, beautiful stuff that I just couldn't use. And like the middle sec, the th about the cell phone, the courier, and you had to, c it was four times as long, wasn't it? You had to like really trim that down because it just w was way too... Well, it was just an incredible, I mean, amount of film. He shot six cameras on everything. And and like I said, I mean, no, it, was, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't really actually what's in the film is fairly close to my first cut but with some slight alterations because like i said i knew that we just didn't have the time to sort of mess around and right. cut of you know like we couldn't have a five hour ver we could have had a five hour version of that movie but we you know we actually ended up it was almost three three and a half three forty five the first cut but even that was really making hard choices even i mean even before we got going so uh there just wasn't the time and i think it it benefited the editing of the film that i didn't you know, just didn't you have four time. Four months or something, right? Four uh, months from. Um, let's see. I uh, I got on the film, and I think it was July. Like no, it was like five five months to from you know the end of shooting to release. Yeah. Which is sure. for a film that has that much footage, it's pretty short. Yeah. Okay, we'll show the clip now. Thank you. Yeah, we we um <coughs> went to great lengths to not dramatize that and just you know in any way is the sort of nature of it and not make it you know make it as sort of un hollywood as possible because of uh, you know in including all the sound and, and just ha and it was also when they did it they didn't um, they didn't know whether they had the guy i mean they didn't know I mean, it was so confusing and it was sort of the idea that it didn't it was just sort of goes by you know that it doesn't become this gigantic moment i mean it does by virtue of the fact of what it is and not because we did anything to it so we just can't I mean, there was, uh, you know, lots of different versions I could have done of that scene <coughs> that would have really, you know, including music and slowing things down or doing things that were very sort of, you know, uh, Hollywood-y, Hollywood <laughs> yeah, Hollywood-like. And it was, you know, we we just stayed out of the way of it all, and uh, including, like I said, no music. Um, my understanding, though, when that they asked that little kid who it was, he said he just basically said it. It's Osama bin Laden. <laughs> I think that's the, in, in terms of what our knowledge is of what happened, um, uh, allegedly that kid just said, yeah, that's who, it was him. So, um, and I think they also, there's a, after he goes in, they shoot him and he's laying there. I believe that they shot him like 50 times, not, you know, and, and Mark Ball really wanted us to do that and, you know, edit, you know in the editing and we tried to, to, you know, I just felt it was inappropriate or just over, you know, it was just too much. So we, we stayed away from that. But 
you know, as far as we know, that's that's the way it went down. But also your emphasis on her re reaction, and you said that you know her performance. Once again, you're dealing with an incredible actress with so much of her backstory is through her eyes and what she, just her face and her performance. And I mean, my 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 when I read the screenplay, I thought it was great. But the only the thing I thought what wasn't there, it wasn't like I needed to have her whole history, but. Um, I just felt like there was a lack of backstory that mm -hmm. made that really made her l more less three dimensional than I would have yeah. liked and and but when I started seeing the performance and what Jessica brought to the character um, so much of it through her and just how you know her acting and the way she, and her depth brought all this backstory and all this three dimensionality to it that you just can't write. Know, right. and um, you know I've been lucky enough to have actors like that, and you know it's just my job to get you know not screw it up. I guess I mean to to find those moments and or and stay out of the way. We'll and stay out of the way of somebody who can act like that, or who's bringing that kind of performance. I mean it's you know you cut the scenes like that with actors like that. It's um, I mean it's just a gift. You know I you know, you part of make me being good is or a lot of the me being good is is uh, the performances that I get. I have a great segue now to Benedict Cumberbatch. Okay, so, um, I mean, he really, um, Benedict Cumberbatch was a revelation, I mean, you're already a fan, but his performance in Imitation Game, which is what we're gonna talk about, um, it's the final film, it's uh, made last year, and, you know, it's about Alan, T uh, he plays Alan Turing, who was a pioneering computer scientist who's mission during World War II was to be part of a team that was cracking, trying to crack the Enigma code, um, which actually contributed to the Allies defeating the Nazis um, in World War II. So um, this is really interesting, not only in terms of the lesson you learn about, the, what did Michael Kahn say, one of the, the bravest things you can do as an editor is deciding not to cut and just letting an actor really <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the great thing about, I mean, obviously you're supposed to have a reason for every cut you make, and the reason might be the shot got boring, but there's supposed to be a, re you're just supposed to cut for cutting's sake, I mean, so, but, and um, I know Michael did, Michael Kahn did this on Lincoln, I mean, he, there were, I mean, I'm, I'm a, he told me that everything Daniel Day-Lewis did was phenomenal, and you could just, it didn't matter what you played it, and he was good in everything, so their biggest decision, and some of the stuff with Benedict as well, just not get out of the way and don't cut and and that's you know you can't do anything to make it any better by edit by doing any editing so you know the, some of the bravest choices are just to not do anything and just to let you know let them act and um uh so there are sequences in the imitation game where it's just benedict and you know he's a full there's one where i think i'm on him for like a minute and a half without cutting um which nowadays is a huge amount of time to be on somebody and that was, and every time I watch that scene, I f I'm thrilled to to not have, you know, to have done so little and have it be so good. Um, yeah, I mean, th I did this movie because, well, I mean, I read the script and it was incredible, and then I knew Benedict was playing Alan Turing, and I didn't really know the director at all, but I took the movie. I you just hadn't even formally met him. You met him at a party briefly. Yeah, and I met him at a loud party, and he's, he's Norwegian and speaks with a heavy accent, so I really couldn't understand <laughs> anything he was saying to me at the time. So, um, and I didn't know who he was. He just kept going on about this movie he had, and he wanted to, me to do it, and I was, I had him, I was available anyway, and I was just trying to be nice, and, and then it turned out that it was the guy from the imitation game. I had no idea, and uh, then the movie I was going to do got pushed, so I was available and quickly called my agent and said, "Is this, you know, is this? Did they hire anybody yet?" And luckily they hadn't. And then I just, by that time, Morton, the director, was in London prepping, and I just talked to him on, on Skype for a half an hour. Um, but based on Benedict and and the script, I, you know, unless I hated Morton, I would have done the movie. But what's also really interesting about this editorially is there's two, three time periods, and the way it was scripted is different than what you came to, um, what you ended up doing, and it's really interesting to talk about. Well, I mean, I, I, half of it is the same, and, and half of it is different. I mean, right. we moved the, you know, the movie takes place, the main stories in the 40s during the war, and then also, um, in the, so in the 50s, after the war, and then Alan as a, a young boy in the, in the late 20s. And um, some of the juxtapositions just didn't work, uh, that were, seemed great in the script, didn't work in, you know, on film. 
the way it was originally scripted was that every time we went to the 20s, we went then to the 50s and then back to the 40s. And we came to realize that was too far away from our main story, which was you know breaking the code and you know trying to win the war and the sort of thriller element of that and the tension of and the, the pressure that was being put on them to try and break this code. So we had to restructure the film a bit to to make you know to find you know logical times to break away from our main story and go either forward or backward in time, and also make those things inform the story so that you know we weren't coming back to where you left off. So you were coming back with new information that forwarded the story in the next time period. So um, because movies with a lot of you know multiple layers like this can get boring if you you know leave one time period and come back exactly where you left off with no new information, that's just going to be boring. So we kept having to re restructure the film to get those moments to work. But it's also another example of trusting the intelligence of the audience. And you said you didn't have to have establishing shots and you, things like, you know, just realize that the emotional thrust and narrative would just make it seamless and mm -hmm. carry the audience through. Yeah, I mean, we, had, and it was Alexander Desplat, actually, the composer who did, who really kind of, you know, clued us in at, at a certain point. And he was, because we were trying to delineate the time periods musically or sonically in a way that would really clue the audience. And he started writing music that was um, tying it all together and making them seamless. And we, were, and we realized, oh my, that's what we should be doing. I mean, that, why are we doing it? Yeah. You know, why are we trying? We're just, we're making one movie, not three. So, um, you know, he, he, he was part of the reason we trusted ourselves or came to trust ourselves and trust the film and sort of, you know, and the audience, e if they were behind for a minute or 30 seconds, then fine. You know, they caught up and they were fine. And, and um, you know, people got it where they were, what time period, especially as we went along and it became clear when you recognize characters and, the, you know, the color palette of certain sequences was different. And, and um, obviously when you saw Alan as played by another character, you always realized, <laughs> another actor, you, knew, you realized who he was. Um, so it, it became one seamless thing instead of three sort of separate films. But you also you kept that undercurrent of you know that this th uh, the archival footage you you didn't show bodies but you showed I mean I don't know if that was a choice uh, it was and we try, I mean I tried it was more about the machinery of war because Alan was sort of fighting the war with his machine you know trying to build this this you know, machine he referred to as Christopher which in real life was they actually called it the bomb um, but uh, he was so it was the machine his machine versus those machines and we didn't want. You know, once you start opening it up, and r I mean, there's a couple of shots of like a body on a stretcher and a young boy who's starving and people eating out of trash cans, and, and but there's not, but you know, there's so much stuff you could do with set with World War II footage, and and it just starts getting into another movie, and we right. wanted it to be, you know, Alan fighting the war with his machine, and you know, the, the machinery of war and, uh, that that the um, you know that the Nazis were using. And the, and the one other thing I want to talk about it before we show the clip is because I think this is fascinating, and this was an editorial thing is, um, so the puzzle pieces of, of his personal life and how the, the convergence of Christopher the machine and the Christopher that he falls in love with as a young boy and, and where you placed that, if you want to talk oh, right. about. Um, well, I mean, one of the bigger structural things we did was, um, I don't know who has seen the film, but, uh, at a certain point, it's revealed what happens to Christopher, the young boy, and uh, that he had died. And that was much earlier in the film, and, and so we came up with the idea to move that later to be sort of be the, the final piece of the puzzle. Um, and so it all sort of clicked together, what motivated everything, you know, and what made him who he was, and, uh, and, um, and keep that a mystery about, about Christopher and what, how that all played out. And then it afforded us this great, juxtaposition at the end, which was young Alan, um, and the actor who played him is just, you know, you get, I've done several movies where there's a young actor playing the star as a kid. And he only looks like him, but he can't act that well. Or they either <laughs> look like him or they don't look like him, and they're usually bad, and you're just cutting around them. And um, in this case, we had this guy, Alex Lothar, who is, I mean, in a, he's in some ways as, uh, just every bit as good as Benedict. So it we're able to hold on this, you know, again, we're on this one single shot uh, where he's getting all this news and it keeps, the camera keeps pushing in and pushing in and you see him trying to maintain uh, and not, just, you know, lose it and, and holding all those emotions in and you can see them all on his face. And so going from that, that big close-up of him with this crushing news going to Alan in the 50s sitting 
with his back to camera uh, in a wide shot facing Christopher, you know, and, and, and sort of that juxtaposition of him broken as a boy against him broken as a, as a man, as a 40, I think he was 42 at that point. Um, it just was incredibly powerful, something we found in the editing room. So moving it, moving that seat was part of that restructure, and that was sort of one of the biggest benefits of it was that, getting that, those two things together. Yeah. Um, do you want to set up the clip? It's um, the one you showed. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> th it's interesting, this clip, and I chose it because um, it just shows you you can make a sort of really exciting, it's almost an a in some ways an action scene about something really smart, and there's nothing in it but just people being smart and figuring things out, and you know, there's a little running around, but, but um, it's the moment where Alan figures out the key to breaking to to breaking the code, and um, it's it's sort of it's fun and it's exciting and smart and and um, it just it kind of shows why this film I think kind of crossed over and became really a, a really successful is because of the entertainment value of it along with it being a really bright a really smart film. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, I just uh, that was a re it's the obviously the most recent film I did, and uh, it was such a great experience to work on and, and get to know everybody on this film and we've become like a family so it, uh, it's just I really like watching it because it reminds me of the experience and, and uh, one one just we're gonna end the panel soon because we're <laughs> way over but I just wanted to ask you because um, you you told an interesting story about the after this scene that there's this sort of the air could have gone out of it. Well, what happens after this is they figure so they figure out you know how to basically how to do it. So they take the the uh, information they've gotten from the machine at that point. They run it through the Enigma box and they realize that they've broken the code and they celebrate. And you know it's a, you know it's but it's not the end of the film. It is similar to the sort of the um, the end of the match race and Sea Biscuit where it's like such a huge moment. You know, how do you? How do you not feel like the movie's over? And because there's like and then basically in this story, then everything becomes complicated because they think they've won the war, they think they've broken this code, and it's going to you know s solve all their problems, and it only creates a whole new set of problems because they can't tell anybody. And it's f finding a way to get you know from one to the other without it feeling like this giant lull in the movie was, you know, an incredible challenge where we you know, how to really sort of throw out the way it was shot and came up with a montage of them working through the night and putting, you know, pins in the in the map of where all the ships were. And, and so we, we couldn't really take, we they s just let them celebrate momentarily and get right into the next beat in a way that felt like, you know, it was organic to the film because it wasn't really shot that way. Um, so it was, you know, and, uh, what probably the biggest challenge was that section through the, re through the whole part that comes after that, which is where, Peter Hilton, um, um, played by Matthew Beard, realizes that his brother is on the con in the convoy that's being about to be uh, sunk by Juma German U-boats. Um, that whole se sequence and making that feel sort of real and organic, and you know, without having too many lulls, was uh, the part we worked on the film worked on the hardest in this film because it was really um, just sort of f making that all fit and feel like it's all one film and making the Peter Hilton part of it feel that it was, you know, not outside the film and not, and make it believable and emotional without making it feel like too much of a contrivance. So that, yeah, well that was, this is a really, was a really tricky part of the film. And the, and the last thing I want to just ask you, I mean, be, I, I know, I think you said you felt it the most on Zero Dark Thirty, but I know you're very emotional about this Alan Turing character who is such a remarkable human being who had such a bad deal <laughs> in life. Um, and the responsibility you feel towards these true life characters and whoever survives them or if they're still alive, I mean, it must be really uh, a, f a feeling of responsibility as an editor when you're working on these films. Well, you do, and uh, I mean, for instance, we just did, you know, I, just, I did Unbroken last year also, and I got to meet Louis Zamperini's family, you know, his daughter, and um, their whole family, and, all, and, and I never got to meet Louis, he, he, he was already in a coma by the time I came on the film and, had, and passed away, but, um, you know, the story is so important to so many people, as is Zero Dark Thirty, as is, you know, as was the Alan Turing, especially, obviously, in London, or in England, um, and you know, we shortly after we finished the film, we showed we showed the imitation game to 15 members of Alan Turing's family, um, and I wasn't able to be at the screening, but you know, I was overwhelmed by, and I wasn't even there because you feel like 
this is these are real families and real lives and 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 you're making this movie to, you know sort of because it's a job and you like it and to make money and all that and then you know but it's their family up on the screen and you real feel you really feel like you want to get it right because when you meet them you know you, you don't first of all you don't want them to hate you and um, you know you feel like, you know it's it's you feel like you want to do justice by them and it's, you know with all these true stories you felt the same way and I'm doing this film right now about concussions in the NF in the National Football League and there's a whole another set of overwhelming uh, you know uh, feelings that I have about getting that right and we've been able to watch the film with some um, players that have rec recently retired from the NFL because uh, of their fear about concussions and and to watch their faces as they're watching this film is it's it's really a moving experience. I mean, you feel like this, you feel the weight of the world on top of you to get it to get it right. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you.